Okay, so I, as, as you said, going right at the end of the day, I think everybody has said an awful lot of things that uh, you've come here to hear about. So hopefully um, I can be quite quick and whiz through a few slides and just tell you a couple of things that we might not have talked about today. Um, and so I work in a very specific area and I think that's something we haven't heard about. I think we've been talking about getting generalizable samples and that's been a big focus. Um, but actually in the work that I do and my colleagues do, at DECAL, which um, I will mention through the talk, so I'll just spell out what that means. This is a research centre at UCL that stands for Deafness, Cognition and Language Research Centre. So as it says on the tin, we at DECAL, my colleagues, are interested in how deafness, sorry, how cognition and language is influenced by deafness. So what can we learn about cognitive development, language development, brain development from working with a special group of people who are born severely or profoundly deaf. So that's our, our typical population, our, our target population that we work with. So what I'm going to do is um, tell you about two things that we've done, actually both in collaboration with Cauldron, uh, in reverse order. So we actually started uh, with the training at the bottom, but I'm going to tell you about the top thing first. So I'm going to tell you about a portal um, that we have developed, which is basically an online site where we have put tests that we've developed at DECAL. I told you about that first, and then I'm going to tell you about some online training that we did as well. Uh, and in case I forget later, I will point out right now that uh, Charles Hume was involved as a collaborator on this online training, even though he uh, said he hadn't done any. He seemed to have forgotten his collaboration <laughs> with me. So memorable <laughs> am I. Uh, but I did remind him before he left. So, um, okay, so this is a very wordy slide. I apologize for that. I don't normally do it this wordy, but there we go. So um, the background to why we wanted to set up this portal um, so these are really simple ideas compared to the amazing things you've been hearing about today. These are very simple ideas. Um, so basically at DECAL we have had ESRC funding for 10 years, centre grant funding. And one of the aims of this, one of the goals of this centre grant funding was to develop tests specifically for, aimed at or designed for people who are deaf. So deaf children and deaf adults because in fact standardized lang cogni cognitive and language assessments are of course designed typically for hearing people there are no norms available for deaf children on these tests and more importantly as you'll see in a minute when i put up the list of tests that we've done actually when we started now 12 years ago there were no tests standardized tests of sign language ability in deaf children or adults available at all so if you were a speech and language therapist or you were a teacher of the deaf working with a deaf child you had to use your own intuition to work out whether there was this child uh, was at an age appropriate level for a deaf child um, and, and so on so this there was a massive need for assessments in this domain so we put a lot of work in, and I say we, I mean a huge team, and I'll, I'll credit that whole bigger team at the end, developing a whole range of tests. And so the aim was to allow practitioners, so teachers of the deaf, sign language, uh, sorry, speech language therapists and so on, and researchers easy access to these tests and so that they didn't just sit on our shelves or indeed they didn't just, they weren't um, published and uh, by individual publishers and then people had to source them uh, individually. We wanted to give people a one-stop shop to give them access to these tests uh, and so that they could deliver them online and administer them online. So, as you might imagine, some of these tests are online scored on automatically. Others, there is an output needed of sign language and these have to be recorded and scored offline. We're not quite at the stage of online uh, sign language uh, uh, scoring yet but projects are underway to develop to do that um, and of course as with anything any of these things with standardized assessments the more data you collect we can of course then investigate these data later for secondary analyses and revise our norms in the future all right so this is the list of tests that we've developed as you can see very British sign language BSL heavy um, and then at the end, two tests as well, looking at speech reading, so more commonly known as lip reading. One for children, one for adults. 
Okay, so we've developed over the 10 years, all different people developed these tests and we wanted to bring these together. And that's it really, I could stop there, that's kind of what we did. But anyway, I'm just <laughs> gonna show you some screenshots of what, of what we developed with, with uh, Cauldron. In fact, this site is being completely revamped at the moment. So um, yeah, in a couple of months, it won't even look like this at all. So you get, on, you get an account, you get online. How do you, and you, yeah, there's all kinds of resources on there. To get an account, you have to apply. So we have, um, we were concerned about who might use these tests. And so we wanted to make sure that kind of parents maybe weren't using them when they might not have the training to use standardized tests. In some situations that might be okay, but for other tests that would probably not be okay. Um, and so people have to apply to say who they are, where they're based, why do they want to use it? So this is, and so also this allows us to screen out people of whom there are a lot saying, um, I'm based in uh, North America and I want to use your test of lip reading with my deaf children. Well, you can use it, but there'll be rubbish on it. I can guarantee because they're lip reading somebody from England and they, are, they, they will not be very good at lip reading somebody from Eng re lip reading British English. Um, and even for sign, like we've even had requests like that for sign language as well. People wanting to use British sign language tests with people in other countries where, as I'm sure most of you know, sign languages in other countries are different languages. That wouldn't work. So we try to screen the, the practitioners that are using this. Uh, and then they, they do then shop. They have to buy access to these tests. Now, of course, this isn't for profit. This is simply to enable us to have a resource that we can maintain over time. So we, um, we have to be able to maintain the site uh, and keep it in line with all, up to date with all the different browsers and so on. So we do charge a nominal fee, for, a, a very small fee for people to use these tests. All right, and of course, then importantly, because these are all evidence-based assessments, they the researchers, sorry, the, or the practitioners are able then to get links to all of the articles that support the tests that have been developed. And then practitioners, they don't want the raw data, right? They want a report that looks like something like this. So they get something that prints out that looks nice, they get a nice report at the end of the assessment, whatever it might be. Whereas, of course, researchers get access to all of the raw data from their tests. Really bland comments here, sorry, but you know, I had to put something in here about uh, people enjoy using it, you know. I, like getting the instant results uh, from speech language therapist comments. Um, it's very efficient. And the main thing is for us that we're making these, uh, these things available to people. So it's good to have access to these things designed specifically for deaf students. So pros, one-stop shop for decal assessment. So we've put this huge amount of investment into developing these things, you know, all these different researchers at decal over 12 years. And I, well, we feel very proud now that we've got them all in one place. So we've kind of we've coordinated them all into one place. And if practitioners or researchers are interested in deafness, they can go there and see what's available. How might it contribute to their management of the child or to a, a, an adult in a clinical situation or indeed to their research? So we're very proud of that. We've not had to deal with ind individual publishers. We've just we've done this ourselves in collaboration with Cauldron. And of course, then when we're promoting it, we can just promote this whole package as one thing. The cons are that it was like herding cats. So with nine different academics who've developed all these different tests, some, most of whom actually have now moved away to other universities, getting all of the information needed to get all of this online has been a challenge, but we have got, we're getting there, I should say. I think we're still work in progress. We're more or less getting there. All right, so that's the first part. I'm gonna be pretty quick, I think. Um, so the second part, training. So then my research in particular is in, I'm interested in a number of different things. One thing I'm really interested in is reading in deaf children. If you've never thought about it before, it may come to you as a surprise to learn that deaf children typically find it difficult to learn to read. And the reason is that when you read, you're reading a spoken language written on the page. And if you've never actually heard that language, it's very difficult to learn to read that language. And so we have, uh, so through this work, we've developed this very simple, idea, uh, I'm not going to obviously bore you with all the background, but this simple idea that lip reading, so speech reading, for deaf children, for speech reading, and maybe for hearing children too, feeds into their phonological representations. So if you've never heard the word cat, 
how do you know it's broken how do you get some awareness that it's broken up into kat, into those speech um, and into those sublexical parts one source of information for about speech for deaf children of course comes from lip reading so we have lots of behavioral evidence uh, longitudinal and correlational evidence and some neuroimaging evidence suggesting that speech reading feeds into phonological contributes to phonological representations of spoken words for a deaf child and that this may may then support early word reading in hearing in deaf children just as phonological awareness does support early word reading for hearing children all right so that's the little blurb about why we're doing this and so we took the big step of testing this idea in an rct so we did an RCT with deaf five to seven year olds, 66 of them. To get 66 deaf children who fit the, fitted the criteria, we had to go to 33 different schools. And this is because deaf children today are typically not in a deaf school, they're actually all out in mainstream settings. So we had to go out and find these children. So we had to deal with 33 different schools. And we did register this on OSF. We had to develop the games, and that was great fun in collaboration with Cauldron. Um, lots of cyclical piloting, play testing. I'll never forget my, our first play test where I had the great idea that I would invite all of my son's reception class round to our house during half term for a massive play date, and that we would pull them off into, um, into you know, side rooms to do play testing. Oh my God, it was chaos. It was <laughs> chaos. All of the, you know, the mums were there, the dads were there, all wanting tea and coffee and things. And then all of the siblings came as well. It was, do not do that. That is my, <laughs> my one piece of advice is do not do play testing at your own house, at least not with a whole reception class. Oh. Uh, <laughs> um, so we did all this and we, and then we had to develop these games that were intuitive uh, to, to a deaf child. So. It, you know, if you have young children and they play games and you develop your own games, lots of them, there's an audio narrative telling you what to do, right? But with deaf children, we couldn't have that audio narrative saying, feed the alien. We didn't want to have a little signer in the corner signing that. So everything had to be completely intuitive. And also, um, Kate mentioned this earlier about making it whizzy and attractive. And, but actually, that can be very distracting for some children. So she said about t having the button to turn that off. And so we had to think about that. We know that deaf children have really good peripheral vision. Well, this isn't really in peripheral vision, but they, their visual attention is slightly different to that of hearing children, we know. And therefore, we didn't want a visual world that was too busy for them. So we had to think about all these things. We had to develop the algorithms, and we had to collect the data to inform the algorithms for this speech reading, none of which existed. So here we go. Here's an example of one of our games. So we developed um, eight different space-themed games, and they were packaged together. So the child, each day when they played the game for 10 minutes, went on a journey, and there was a narrative, and, they had to ch and there was some um, uh, choice in there for the child as well. And so they could choose their captain and so on. And one thing, actually, that we... This is maybe not of interest to you, but I, we, we quite liked adding this in, that somebody within our deaf community of advisors had suggested that we put at the beginning was that the child, these are five to seven year olds, remember, at the very beginning, the speaker would be maybe two things. Maybe they'd be sat with their back to them and the child had to make them turn around so they'd be facing them. And then when they faced them, they said, hello, we're ready to start, or whatever. Or the, the light would be dark and they had to press a button to make it light. So this was at the beginning of each session they had to do this. And this gate it was trying to teach them about some autonomy, about, you know, if a deaf child is speaking to somebody and somebody's talking like this and they can't see, it's good to say, I can't see you. I need to see your face. All right, so it's the end of the day. Let's see how good your lip reading skills are. Many of you have seen these before, so I apologize. Uh, so you're gonna see somebody in the right top hand corner say a word, and then you choose from the ones at the bottom what you think he said. This is a very easy one. So it's easy based on how easy the actual word is to lip read and also the competitors. So see what you think. Is that an easy one? Yeah. <laughs> they like that one. So that was easy. Helicopter has lots of syllables, doesn't have many competitors. This is a more difficult one with more competitors. Uh, 
Okay, so you get the idea. So there are lots of different games like this, and um, we were worried in designing this, weren't we, Joe, that um, the kids might like the throwing up a bit too much and get it wrong on purpose, but it didn't seem to be a problem. And then we were in, because this is essentially a visual phonics training game, we also had um, segmenting and blending in here. Blending, not segmenting there. No. Okay, so this was an RCT, and so we recruited these kids. They went into two arms. They either did the speech reading training I've just shown you, or they did maths. Exactly the same games, just here working with number um, and shape and different things. All right, so you get the idea. Hmm. Okay, so there we randomized them into two arms they did 12 weeks of training we went back to see them straight away and then we went back three months later so this went over a whole academic year so i'm just going to give you a schematic of what we found so i uh, i should have said i should have said <laughs> i'm going back that our so our, our this is the whole model we were testing but our primary outcome measure was speech reading so our primary outcome measure was can we train speech reading uh, can we improve speech reading performance when we train speech reading? Now this seems really straightforward and you would hope the answer is yes, and indeed it is. But actually this hadn't been shown before, with, especially not in an RCT, with young deaf children. And there are questions about whether you can, whether we could train speech reading. It seems we could. And the measure here, the outcome measure is with models they haven't been trained on and also on items they haven't been trained on. So they're not simply improving on what they see, that is actually generalising. So we, sit, we saw gains in speech reading, we see um, some gains in phonological representations as well, I'm not going to bore you with how we've tested that, but actually it didn't come through into single word reading. And this kind of comes back to what Charles was kind of saying before when he, I think his exact words were something like all online training of language um, are, cr are crap, <laughs> I think is what, is what he actually said. Um, and, and, and what we're doing here is essentially a, an online phonics training program for deaf children. But we know from lots of work, including lots of that from Charles and others, that to improve reading, so to feed through this developmental pathway to actually influence single word reading, what we need to do is combine the phonics with language. So if any of you are familiar with the simple view of reading, this proposes that to be a good reading comprehender, you need good phonics skills and good language skills, and that the best... Uh, combination in when it comes to training is to combine phonics training with and, and embed that within a literacy program <laughs> so not to work on these words in isolation but to then actually have the kids work on these words in texts with pictures and so on so that's our next step is to take this kind of isolated phonics program and embed it within a broader literacy program all right, I think I'm done. Oh no, pros and cons. So, uh, you know, this is a bit embarrassing after the whole day of what we have all said. So pros, we all know, yes, we can get, roll it out, get lots more people. And we can get hard to reach people as well, because for us, as I said, we've got, you know, children all over the place, that, these deaf children. And um, so having this online, having um, them do this at school online without our researchers having to go and be there every day, of course, has massive benefits. It's all recorded and all automatically backed up. Um, and the cons, there are cons. There are issues of adherence to the training, which are part, so the main issues here, Kate Nation spoke about earlier, really, working in schools is incredibly challenging at the best of times. Um, and so, you know, you would turn up, and Lizzie, who's here, had the experience recently of turning up to a school to do some work, and it was an inset day, and they hadn't told her. You know, those kind of things come up all the time. Little Johnny's off because they're ill. Um, and so those issues come up all the time. But of course, when you're dealing with something online, then we have all those issues that Kate talked about before of having to deal with the terrible infrastructure in many of the schools. Many don't actually have Wi-Fi. If they do have Wi-Fi, it's not very good. So, you know, you've got to come up with solutions to all those things, um, getting through firewalls, massive problems. So that, that took a lot of time to get through. Um, and because we were streaming videos, that was often a challenge as well. But we got there and we completed the study. 
And that is more or less all I've got to say, apart from, uh, so these are the people involved in the decal assessment portal. These are the current decal uh, team. Um, these are the people who, who kind of led that. And then this is the massive team involved in that STAR, that, that training uh, program. I did want to finish with one little anecdote um, Vaughan was saying before about choosing how to do this. And we, as you have worked out, went for the let's pay somebody money to do this. And we did the same as you. We put in our grant money for a programmer and then realized, actually, that's not going to work. So we did exactly the same thing. Uh, and then we you know, were looking around for who to work with. And we went out to different people. And somebody recommended that we talk to a recent graduate of UCL who just set up their own company. Um, and was working around the corner and they came and he was absolutely lovely and charming and spent 20 minutes in the room talking to us and then he kind of said you know I don't think what we do is right for you but you know good luck with your project and here's some other people you could talk to uh, and about six months later when I heard Dennis Hussabis on the radio having sold his deep mind to Google I realized that I probably just wasted 20 minutes of his very precious time <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. so thank you very much Thank you.